Good morning, everyone. Before I turn the mic over to our presenter this morning, this is Dee Miles. I'd like to uh, bring your attention to a few upcoming activities. Tomorrow night, we will have a um, webinar with the um, with a subcommittee of the Political Action Commission, the Subcommittee on Immigrants' Rights will be uh, running a webinar uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern concerning the fight uh, against the state uh, the scapegoating of uh, of immigrants and uh, the myths and lies being promoted uh, relative to the immigrant. Uh, community, uh, which really uh, hurts us all. So we hope you will uh, mark your calendar and plan to attend uh, that uh, webinar tomorrow night, October 6th, that would be uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, also upcoming on mm, October, well, I forget the actual date, so I'll just say later in October, we will have a young Marxist presenting on uh, the environment. So we, uh, and that uh, activity will be sponsored by the Working Class Think Tank. We hope you will join us for a, um, a workshop uh, 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 presentation by young Marxists concerning uh, the environment. Uh, uh, later in October, I think it's October 27th, but I'd have to, uh, I'd have to, um, I may be uh, mistaken. Please look for the invitation in your uh, in your uh, email uh, and uh, other announcements. Then, lastly, we we will in in November be doing a a, a book talk on. Now, I'm going to pronounce his name Afanasiev. I've heard some people say Afana, uh, well, say something else, but it's uh, on historical materialism. Uh, you can access the text, historical materialism by Viktor Afanasiev uh, through international publishers. We will be doing that uh, book talk November 24th uh, at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern. So we hope you will join us for all of the uh, upcoming activities. And now I will turn the mic over to our presenter this morning, Mark. You have the floor. Thanks, Dee. Appreciate it, and hope uh, everybody uh, checks out some of those uh, the other great webinars and town halls that we're doing. Uh, nationally. So this is the session four, the last session of this series. Um, I, I very much appreciate your sticking with me for all of them uh, and uh, for participating and uh, hopefully sharing this with your club and uh, uh, people you work with. Um, so today we're going to talk about strategy development and how that is an application of the dialectical method and uh, then go on to talking about our strategy in the present moment. Uh, looking at uh, Joe Sim's main report to the convention and uh, a couple of sections of our party program. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of the outline for today. Um, I'm trying to sort of uh, bring things back full circle. We started out with the dialectical method and now returning to that as we look at analyzing the current moment and developing our current strategy. So first, a quick review of the dialectical method. This is my simplified eight-step version. Uh, break things in whatever subject it is you're looking at into its component pieces, learn the contradictions within in each piece that drive change, uh, examine the quantitative and qualitative aspects of each of those pieces and their history, how they've developed, what quantitative changes have happened, at what point uh, do qualitative leaps happen. And then once you have that understanding of those pieces, the, the piece that often gets missed is putting it back together and looking at the whole, then 
figuring out the history of the whole and where the qualitative tipping points are, figure out which aspects are crucial and necessary and which are less so, uh, examine the whole in its connections with even broader processes and the history of those connections, and eight, always pay attention to what is new and growing and what struggles are driving current change. So that's just a quick review of the dialectical method that we uh, talked about in the, the first session. So strategy development is how do we apply the dialectical method to understanding the present moment? What are the main issues and movements? For example, inflation, immigration, abortion, the economy, democracy, and we could go on. How do those issues relate to each other? What are the quantitative and qualitative aspects? So we look at polls, we look at new voter registrations, we look at amount of money raised, we look at the results of special elections, um, we look at uh, you know the polling not just about candidates but about issues. Those are the quantitative things that we're measuring that can help us figure out when we're at a qualitative moment. How do state and national elections interact this year? Because there are states where abortion rights is, is on the ballot, and that will drive progressive voters to the, the voting booths. Uh, are there minimum wage increases on the ballot? That too brings out working class voters in a way that other issues don't. So when they're on the ballot, that can change the results of an election in a state. And that hence affects the national picture. How do those things interact? Then we need to look at the level of unity of the main organizations and movements, all the many civil rights movements, the labor movement, the peace movement, the pro-democracy movement, the youth movement, the environmental movement, and, and more. Um, and then we can look at what is the significance of what has changed since the previous election. For example, the rate of youth voting has been going up uh, over the last uh, last two cycles. Uh, there, another thing of significance is that even though it's still a small number of Republican leaders comparatively, it's not the Republican Party or any section of the Republican Party, but the number of Republican leaders endorsing Harris is a significant change. There were some in 2020, there's more now. What is the level of understanding of the threat to democracy among the populace? Is that a, a theoretical issue or do people feel it as a gut issue? These are just a few of the relevant questions that we would need to ask and consider uh, to come to a more dialectical understanding of the present moment on which to base our strategy. So Marx's strategy and tactics, we need to consider the scale. So uh, people often get confused. What's a strategy and what to, what's a tactic? And I contend that this is mostly about scale because strategy for a lo local election campaign will be, be just a detail of the national election campaign. From the national perspective, local election approaches are tactics. While for the local activists, those tactics are their strategy. So it's a matter of scale. What scale are we talking about? Uh, whether something is a strategy or a tactic also depends on context and long range goals. Is this a strategy for uh, winning an election and getting uh, to the next phase of struggle? with hopefully a shift in the balance of forces in the process? Or is this just one step as part of the strategy to reach to socialism? So you, you have to take that scale into account to know whether you're talking about a tactic or a strategy. And th there's no um, people off strategy is big and important and tactics are little and less important. Well, that depends on your perspective. That depends on the scale. That depends on, are you talking about, are we going to win the mayoral election in our town, which will have a big impact on the future in our town, uh, but not much uh, effect elsewhere? Or is this a state or national issue? And so we need to uh, look at that, uh, look at it from that 
long range scale and long range perspective. We also have to look at context. Lenin noted that the essence of Marx's strategy is correctly estimating the balance of forces. Uh, estimating the balance of forces involves questions such as who are our allies? What is necessary to unify a broad-based coalition? What approach or framing will unite the most people and organizations? Uh, my example of this goes back to the Free Angela campaign when there were some who were arguing that the strategy ought to be not focused on Angela but focused on freeing all political prisoners, uh, a laudable goal and objective. Henry Winston, our national chair at the time, argued that the petition campaign to uh, for bail for Angela, not to, even to declare her innocent, but just for bail so that she could get a fair trial and participate fully in her own defense. That was the thing that would unite the most people, the most organizations, bring about the biggest chance of changing the atmosphere. And that was eventually adopted, though it was quite contentious at the time. And he proved right in the case of the defense of Angela Davis. She was freed. She was declared innocent by a jury. Uh, there's an excellent book called Jury Woman by Mary Timothy. She was the chairperson of the Angela Davis jury, a sort of middle of the road, moderately progressive, uh, socially active, but not terribly politically active person. And she ended up being the chair. And it's the story from her perspective of what won her, what were the issues that struck her, and she led that jury to that uh, verdict of innocent. So that's one set of questions. What approach, what framing, how do we win the most people, get the most people engaged? Also, who is the main enemy? Who are the allies of the main enemy? what splits exist in the ruling class, and how can our strategy help drive wedges into those splits? People have talked about wedge strategies for decades, mostly because the Republicans use them constantly and at times effectively. But from our side, how can we widen the splits in the ruling class? How can we make temporary alliances? How can we adjust our strategy so it makes possible the broadest unity? Uh, because that broad unity will drive splits into the working class, will drive wedges into those splits and widen them. And our goals uh, are closely linked with scale and scope. We need to align them. Uh, there's no sense saying, well, our goal is socialist revolution, so uh, why isn't that our campaign slogan this election season? Well. Winning an election is a very different proposition than the fundamental transformation of society. So if our goals aren't linked to the scale that we're actually working on, uh, they become pointless. What we have to ask, what are the broadest, most fundamental, most unifying goals? For example, is our basic goal to win a particular strike and or to give workers a sense of their own power? Or is it to build the union long term and or to unite more of the labor movement using a particular struggle as the vehicle for building that unity? These can be complementary goals, but our strategy will vary depending on which is in the forefront at the present moment. So the most important strategic question is, what is the path to changing the balance of forces? Because strategy is not an abstract question separate from the real circumstances. It requires starting with our real circumstances, a hard-nosed look at what reality is that we're dealing with, then figuring out what is needed to shift that balance, developing a strategic plan. Then we have to do the work because practice is primary. Practice is the test of theory. Practice is the test of strategy. And then once we've engaged in the work and in a position to draw some lessons, readjusting our strategy as circumstances change. 
So because the goal for us in any struggle is not limited to that struggle. The goal, goal always includes working to change the balance of forces. And that the reason for that is that will make further victories possible. It will connect this struggle with the broader struggles in society. It will weaken the opposition for the next struggle. And it can lay the basis for a broader unity in the next set of struggles. And it will help shift the balance of forces in a progressive direction. Uh, like everything, strategy is a process, not a one-time procedure because everything is always in the process of change. And the only way we learn if our strategy is correct is to put it into practice and see what happens. As circumstances change, strategy must also change. Uh, and so where do we engage in this strategy development? We engage in it in all our collectives. It's not an individual process. It's not me sitting here rubbing my chin and or twirling a mustache if I still had one uh, and figuring it out. It's about our collective experience and expertise gained through years of engagement in the struggle. We engage in our clubs, in our leadership bodies on all levels. Uh, an example of this is our program. Uh, in 2019, before the 2019 convention, we went through the pre-convention discussion process, focused a lot on our program, and we got submissions uh, and amendments and proposals and questions from individuals, from clubs, from uh, district con commissions, from national commissions, from designated leadership bodies at all levels of the party. Uh, we had literally hundreds of submissions to help us deepen and polish our strategy and our writing and our analysis. We also engage in strategy development as we engage with others in the struggle. They have lessons to teach us about what works and what doesn't, about how to mobilize new generations, about how to adapt to changing circumstances. And uh, an important but neglected point is that discussing strategy with those we work with is part of winning them to socialism, part of winning them to our approach, part of convincing them that victory is possible. Not because we tell them, but because we discuss it in the process of struggle, which they are also engaged in. And we can also use our self-study to guide our practice and our work. So the steps in the strategy development process is ask a lot of questions and make sure you're asking the right questions. Identify the long range goals, but don't stop there. Identify the main enemy or enemies. Identify the main allies in the core forces. Understand the splits among the enemies. Understand the obstacles to unity among potential allies, such as racism, sexism, xenophobia, nationalism, anti-communism, all of these uh, wedges that the right uses to drive wedges between uh, progressive allies. We have to understand the main issues under contention and how best to frame them to build maximum unity and understand the stakes for each side. Uh, for Trump, obviously, one of the stakes is to keep himself out of jail. That's, uh, he, he, you know, once if he was reelected and reinstated as president, he would uh, be able to cancel many of the prosecutions against him, not the state level ones, but all of the national ones. So that's a big stake for him and it's gonna drive his desperation and his lying and his escalation of calls to violence. But that's not all. After the strategy development process, we proceed to implementation learning from reality, what works and what doesn't, deep, deepen our understanding of all of the pieces of the process as we work through them and pay attention to what is changing and then readjust our strategy. As the strategy balance of forces changes, strategy has to change. We touched on this question in response to a question from one of the participants uh, at the last session. 
In the 1950s in South Africa, the African National Congress mostly organized nonviolent resi resistance to fascist apartheid with mass protests, civil disobedience, legal challenges, etc. After years of violence, violent repression and the fascist government slowly closing all avenues of mass protest, making them illegal, making them subject to police or military violence. Uh, in the mid-1960s, the African National Congress changed its strategy because the situation has changed. There was no longer sufficient room for nonviolent protest. So the ANC changed its strategy, shifting to military opposition and sabotage, training for military operations, founding uh, Spear of the Nation. They also la launched international solidarity campaigns to bring new forces to bear, new pressure to bear on the apartheid regime. Uh, and after several decades of this level of campaigning, in the early 1990s, the maneuvering room for the apartheid regime shrank due to the popular resistance uh, due to the ANC organized resistance, due to the military campaigns of the ANC, and due to the international campaign, which was increasingly isolating uh, the apartheid regime. They saw an opening for a negotiated end to apartheid, and the ANC shifted again, engaging in the negotiations and committing to participating in the transition and upcoming elections. So the goal of ending apartheid didn't change at all. But as the balance of forces shifted, the ANC and the South African Communist Party as a partner also shifted strategy to adapt to those new circumstances. So, you know, they didn't just uh, adopt nonviolence as a purely moral issue. They also recognized when things had shifted and that no longer had the room to sufficiently uh, organize the opposition. And then when the situation changed again, they recognized now is the time for negotiation without an uh, expanded and protracted civil war. We can end apartheid. It will be difficult. It will have its own challenges, but we're willing to engage in that process because we have a peaceful path to transition now that we didn't have in the mid 60s or throughout the 70s or 80s. So again, the goal stayed the same, but the strategy kept shifting as the balance of forces shifted. So I'm going to talk a briefly about basic CPUSA strategy. It is to build unity among the core forces of workers, oppressed peoples, women, youth, build unity between movements and issues and movement organizations such as unions, all the civil rights organizations, pro-democracy movements, and on and on. Uh, and those those two are you know match sets, shall we say. Um, then we work to link the issues and build coalitions. That's on the basis of the unity that's developing. You develop joint working projects, uh, joint goals, joint activities, joint strategy. And you can bring in other groups, including groups that are not necessarily progressive. So for example, the League of Women Voters is uh, determinedly, determinedly, I think that's a word, uh, uh, nonpartisan. However, when democracy, the right to vote is threatened, they can, they will actively participate with many people in that struggle. So uh, building those coalitions brings in even more forces. Another part of our strategy is to engage on every field of struggle we can. This is limited because we're still a small party, but there is no field of struggle that we should abandon to the class enemy. Whether it's working on the job, in electoral struggles, building coalitions, engaging in civil disobedience, doing forms of mass education, mass demonstrations, legal battles, our movement and our party should engage to the degree that we can on 
all those fields of struggle and not give our opposition the free reign uh, to to uh, have an entire field of struggle left to them. Uh, we work to defeat the extreme right, which is the main obstacle to progress, the main enemy on all progressive issues, and the most anti-democratic force. And the main goal of this stage of struggle is to shift the balance of forces decisively against the extreme right, move increasingly from defensive strategies to fight and defensive struggles to fighting for real solutions. So that's a, a short summary of our basic strategy, uh, which is centered around what we think is the main broadest unifying theme, the fight for democracy. And that's because it provides a framework to fight for the unity of many kinds and to fight divisions in the working class and people. It places the struggles against racism, sexism, and for full civil rights at the center. It unites us with progressive but thus far non-revolutionary allies. And it protects our ability to engage in struggles of many kinds, electoral demonstrations, civil disobedience, strikes, boycotts, petitions, postcard campaigns, and on and on. So this, uh, this field of struggle the fight for democracy is the field on which the unity that we're trying to build gets created. It's where trust gets built. It's where uh, people realize we have shared goals or shared aims and we can work together and we'll all be stronger for it. That, hap that doesn't happen in the abstract. It happens in the process of the fight for democracy, the fight to protect and extend our democracy. So why is this our strategy? It matches, this is the first and foremost part, it matches the objective needs of the working class and allies. That comes from our analysis of the current moment and the challenges of the current moment and what the objective needs of our class and our allies are right now. It connects us to the struggles and movements that have to come together to have a majoritarian movement for fundamental progressive change. Uh, fundamental transformation, socialist revolution, uh, those things don't happen uh, by a small group sitting around the table. They might start there, but that's not powerful enough to fundamentally transform society. Counter-revolutions can be a coup, can be plotted in a small room with a handful of people if they're powerful enough and well-connected enough. Revolutions can't. They are profoundly democratic struggles. So that requires us to win majority to that idea of fundamental progressive change. And some people get there in one leap. And we hope when they get there in one leap, they join our party. But others have to go through the experience of the struggle themselves to learn that, uh, for example, in the environmental movement, you can be in favor of clean air and clean water all you want. And uh, Trump and Vance proclaim that they're in favor of clean water and clean air. <laughs> uh, but what is it going to actually take? And as soon as you start looking at what dirties the water and dirties the air, you run up against the capitalist system and the political system. And hence, people draw fundamental conclusions, more fundamental conclusions, by engaging in the struggle and learning who the enemy is and what tools the enemy uses. Um, uh, it's also, it helps divide the most militaristic, most chauvinist, most, most authoritarian sections of the capitalist class from the sections that prefer to rely on the legitimacy of the existing system. It drives a wedge, as we're seeing right now in the campaign. It has the aim of shifting the balance of forces from defensive struggles to working for real solutions and uh, to do so, we need to end the stranglehold of the extreme right on our political systems. And that's from the presidency to the Senate to Congress to state legislatures and governors, uh, all the way down to uh, smaller local struggles. Uh, wherever the right has a foothold on power or a stranglehold on power, they use that 
to uh, defeat any steps to pro real progressive solutions. And the struggle for democracy enables us to use that framework to link together many movements. And as they work together, they build trust, confidence, and shared values, uh, which lays the basis for greater unity in the next struggle. Our extended CPUSA strategy is that as we move from defensive to proactive struggles, as the balance of forces shifts, our, our strategy will shift from our current anti-extreme right strategy to an anti-monopoly strategy, uniting all in opposition to the monopolies, the oligopolies, and the transnational corporations which unites the working class, its natural allies and the core forces, small business interests, all progressive movements, even some medium-sized business interests, because those medium-sized and small businesses get squeezed out of the marketplace by monopolies. Uh, you see this when um, Walmart, for example, uh, somebody gave me the example of uh, they uh, there was a vacuum cleaner company, I don't know the name of it, and they went and said, we'll, uh, we'll take, you know, 30% of your production. And then the next year they wanted 50%. And the year after that, they wanted 100%. Pretty soon, Walmart was the only customer for that. At that point, Walmart went back to that company and said, well, you have to cut your prices by 20 prices to us by 20% or we're not going to buy anything from you and we'll drive you out of business or you can sell yourselves to us. Uh, so even reasonably large businesses can get squeezed by monopolies. So they have a self-interest in an anti-monopoly strategy. Now, of course, we're not going to rely on them as the basis for the struggle, but they can be a temporary vacillating ally in the struggle against monopoly. Once there is a further shift in the balance of forces, when the anti-monopoly strategy helps win more victories, bring more people in the struggle, bring more forces into the struggle, there's a further shift in our strategy, which moves on to the direct struggle for socialism. Once the working class, its organized sector, and the coalition partners have gained enough strength that they can contend directly with the capitalist class for power. So our current strategy is the anti-extreme right strategy. But as the balance shifts, uh, our strategy escalates and uh, tackles more fundamental questions at each step. So I should make clear, there's no wall between these different stages. We engage in struggles against monopolies right now. That's just not our main focus, but there's no, uh, there's no prohibition against engaging in struggles against monopolies. Uh, you know, there, there are all kinds of uh, particular struggles against particular monopolies that we fully participate in. Uh, it's just not the central organizing principle at this current stage. Another example is that at the current stage of building our all people's front against the extreme right, we continue to advocate for socialism. Again, that is not our main focus, but it is still part of our educational and agitational work, including at this stage and every stage up to and after the victory of socialism. Uh, the idea of stages of struggle is not to set up an abstract schema and force every strategy and tactic into that framework. It's to make our current main tasks clear. Uh, we won't get to the struggle for socialism until we assemble a coalition big enough to de decisively defeat the extreme right. So to, in order to make progress, in order to change the balance of forces, in order to be able to move to the next stage of struggle, we need to block the fascists from taking full control of the main levers of power and prevent them from implementing their anti-democratic agenda. And this gives us the political space to build the progressive movements, to build the unity between them. And it enables us to use that democratic space to build all build alliances and work to shift the balance of forces in a progressive direction.
So sometimes people say, well, why not just move to the direct struggle for socialism? Uh, if that had a chance of success, I'd be all for it. But wishing we were there doesn't make it so. Wishing we were in a revolutionary situation, even having the material conditions for a revolutionary situation doesn't create that situation by itself. Millions of people have to go to that process and be ready to take the next stage take it to the next level. The whole idea of strategy is to map out the balance of forces that fit the current, current circumstances and figure out how to shift that balance. Because we can't only preach our way to socialism, we have to engage in struggle with tens of millions of workers who are not yet revolutionary. Uh, I've uh, seen arguments about this to say, well, um, you know, this isn't perfect and this isn't, this union is not doing exactly what it ought to be doing and this union is backward and that movement is not ready to unify with other movements and yada yada and we need to, we need to step up our arguments for socialism uh, because those folks are not, they're not there and they're not going to come along. Those millions of people will learn to be revolutionary in the process of their own struggle. Their own experiences will help teach them that. And as they learn from their experiences, they will be ready to listen to our lessons and our preaching about the need for fundamental economic and political change. Uh, not just because we're saying it, because it matches their reality and their understanding based on their own engagement in the struggle. So the whole idea of these stages is to increasingly win people, win organizations, and win movements to that understanding based on their own struggles and their own engagement in the broader struggles. So I'd like to take a brief break now and uh, give some time for your questions and comments and or I offer a couple of questions for discussion if you want to opine on these. How does our strategy differ from the outlook of other progressive forces? And if Trump is defeated, will that represent a decisive defeat of the extreme right? So I'll turn it back over to you, Dee, for a moment. Okay, the floor is open for questions and comments. Alexander, your mic is open on our end. Hello, I'm Alexander from Virginia. Uh, I'm a CPUSA member, um, and uh, I asked a question in like the comments. Basically, it goes, uh, "What are some strategies and tactics to create alliances in a coalition way, such as with immigrants, rights groups, tech, Latinx groups, LGBTQ uh, groups, and labor unions? Can you give specific uh, details and maybe some tactics and strategies that you've done?" And one last thing is. Uh, I do agree with the uh, with the, the the discourse about quote unquote converting people to Marxism Leninism is is fraught with error, and that we can't. But that at the same token, how do you work with other groups about like let's say like like entering a group and not doing entryism, for example? Uh, but you want to work with a group and you want to work in it within it. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Looking for more questions and comments. Okay, Devin. Okay, so um, I've I've been trying to work with a lot of other people, um, and and getting other people involved when when you kind of it seems to be difficult when you try to talk about socialism with people because they all you know it's just that knee jerk reaction that you get from people. Um, even though on a lot of topics they'll tend to agree with the socialist position on things, it's really difficult to get people to think of anything other than, you know, Reds killed trillions or whatever. And um, I was just wondering if you had a little more insight as to how to um, maybe talk to people who are amenable to the causes that socialism supports, but, you know, say, well, we're, we're not going to do um, – I don't know, whatever it is that they had an issue with with other previous socialist administrations. I'm not really sure where I'm going with this question, but uh, yeah, I just found it difficult to, you know, talk to people who, you know, aren't already, 
uh, let's say, radicalized enough to understand that this system is untenable and they constantly think that, oh, no, we can reform our way out of it. You know, any other insight onto maybe how to talk to people about that? That's about all for me. Thank you, Devin. Okay, Dimitri. Thank you. I just want to respond to Devin very quickly because there are people who agree almost with everything that we say. And then, you know, he said trillions. Basically, the argument is Stalin. And I don't think we necessarily have to get into the discussion of Stalin. I think it would be useful to say, well, you know, yes, there were mistakes under socialism, but do you realize that we in the United States ran slave labor camps for 300 years? That we eliminated the Native American? Is Stalin that much worse? Do you want to just compare atrocities? Our nation is born in atrocities. Yes, there were some atrocities under socialism, but the goal was equality of all people. Our goal certainly was not equality. Yes, we have grown greatly in our country, and we want to be the future. It is truly the American dream of socialism. We don't have to look at other people's mistakes. We have made enough. But also look at the beauty of America. How many utopian societies came here to create a beautiful new world from New England out to Utah? Regardless of what we think of their beliefs, they came with ideals. So as Comrades said, there is the dialectic of opposites. And we are against the one for slavery, genocide, and fascism. We contribute to, to the tradition of American optimism, of building a better country. And damn, we've done a good job. But you see the dialectical interrelationship. And unfortunately, not only do the fascists have a hold on us today, they are in the roots of the tree of the nation. Okay. We can't better it. I'm sorry, Dave. No, thank you. Thank you. Looking, uh, one more run through, looking for any more raised hands. Okay, back to you, Mark. Well, thanks for uh, all those who. Uh, verbalized. Um, let, let me first uh, talk about the things that Devin and Dimitri said. Um, and I think, Devin, there's a, it, the, the focus of the question is uh, a, a little off center. And because the reality is, there's no way that we can make them think differently than they do. There's no way, there's no way to have just the perfect argument. Um, because it's not just about having the best argument. I think the best response that you're right, that is a big obstacle. It's very widespread. All of our members of our party run into it to one degree or another. But it's not just about how to talk to them or having the best arguments. It's about moving that focus to not be their knee-jerk reactions to socialism and communism, it's to focus on what unifies us. You say, because we can't make them think differently, we have to focus on what unites us, what we already agree on, and say, you're not ready to take that step with us yet. That's fine, let's work together on the things we do agree on. Let's make progress, let's win victories. Let's build our trust and confidence and understanding in the process of working together because it's the working together on goals they already agree about that is the key to changing their mind. It's not, there, there is no perfect argument that's gonna win the day. Um, I wish there was, it would be easier if that was the case, but that's not the reality. And that's what I mean when we say 
I say we can't preach our way to socialism. We do have to preach about socialism. We do have to talk about it. We do have to argue with people about it. But that's not the focus. The focus is not to get them uh, to agree with us and, uh, and overcome their uh, opposition to socialism and communism. The answer lies in working together where they learn to trust us and trust our judgment, trust our hard work, trust our vision of what is possible and what it takes to win those victories. Um, I, I agree with Dimitri about, um, you know, Focusing on the, the positive things about history, our connection and uh, our contribution to that history, which is very significant and uh, not well known except in uh, smaller circles. Um, I do recommend uh, to avoiding the Stalin discussion because that's a rabbit hole that we go down. We had, I think it was the uh, convention in two, night in 2000, the party convention, and we had, uh, you know, social media was just coming uh, into existence. It was pretty rudimentary, and we had a totally open, unmoderated forum for our pre-convention discussion. There was a lot of good discussion on it. It was a good initiative to take, but there were people who joined with the determination to change our position about Stalin and uh, various other historical things, and they inundated that forum with that debate, which was totally beside the point of building unity now for the current struggles we're engaged in right now. So it's a, uh, we do have to have that discussion with people, but that's not our focus now. Our focus is on how do we unite today? You say, well, you're not ready for socialism or communism. That's right. Let's join hands and defeat Trump. Let's join hands and uh, make sure abortion rights are reinstated and expanded. Uh, you don't like what the proposals from the extreme right about democracy are, let's work together hand in hand to expand that democracy. That will prove that we're, uh, we're in favor of democracy. We're in favor of all steps and all forms of expanding democracy. We don't see that as uh, the solution by itself, but we, we're not afraid of it or wanna hide from it. We wanna work together, maybe in the process, We'll continue to talk about this because what we want them to do is not to agree with us just because we argue them to that. We want them to agree because they are committed to that struggle and understand based on their own experiences why we need to take that next step. Uh, this is, I think, especially true of uh, that's a that's that's a tangent. I'll avoid that at the moment. Uh, going back to Alexander and the question about alliances and tips and tricks and uh, entryism. Um, and uh, entryism, I mean, we've uh, in the 1930s and sometimes in the 60s and 70s, and again today, we're engaging in experiments with what's called salting, sending uh, workers into uh, into uh, industries with the aim of organizing, salting the workers with people already committed to building the union. And their job is not to just to do their job, but also to build connections and alliances with the people that they're working with. Um, entryism is taking that past the point of, well, we're gonna send in an, a few organizers to help in the process to, uh, we're gonna pack this meeting so we win the vote. We're going to take over the leadership so that we have control of the leadership. That's, we're not interested in that. We're interested in what is it gonna to take to win people to the struggle? What is it gonna take for them to be more committed to the struggle? What does it take to convince them that we can win victories through the struggle and let's engage in those struggles together? Um, I, I wish I had some handy uh, tips and tricks for uh, building alliances other than focusing on what unites us. Our willingness to work with people who are not yet revolutionary. 
uh, you know, when you end up saying, well, so and so doesn't take this position now, and so and so is not doesn't want to talk about socialism, and so and so has delusions about communism. The answer to that is not to argue them out of their positions. The answer is to say, well, what are you ready to work for now? What can we work on together? How can we struggle together? How can we build the things that we both, the goals that we both share into a much broader struggle? That's that's our contribution. Our contribution almost uniquely is that emphasis on unity. Um, that's a, a, a key uh, way that communists need to function in the mass movement. The fight for unity, the fight to overcome division, the fight to uh, clearly identify what the main issues are, who the main enemies are, who the main allies are, and to uh, talk about a strategy aimed at winning victories. That's our contribution to those mass movements. And it's not a self-interested one. It's not a, uh, you know, uh, a behind the scenes game play. Uh, I heard, uh, it, this is in the late 60s, I heard about a time earlier in the 1960s, in the days of the struggle against the anti-Vietnam War, where the Young Socialist Alliance, which was the youth arm of the Trotskyite Socialist Workers Party, approached the Young Workers Liberation League, the precursor, the inheritor and precursor of the Young Communist League. And they approached us and said, if we work together, we can win the chairmanship and we can then run the coalition. And we turned them down because our interest was not a narrow interest in promoting ourselves or in gaining some kind of parochial control over one section or another of the movement. Our goal was to build the movement, to increase the unity, to bring more forces in, to not put ourselves at the center, but put the issue and the unity at the center. So that's the best uh, tip and trick I can afford you to remember that what is most revolutionary is not always what sounds most revolutionary. It's most revolutionary to actually build a movement capable of restricting U.S. support for Israelis war against Gaza. That's more important than how radical that movement sounds. So what does it take to build a mass movement? That's the questions we have to focus on, and that's our best argument to convince others. Not that we're right, so we should be leading, but we are all in this together and we need this struggle to be victorious. What is it gonna take? What forces do we have to bring in? What alliances do we have to make? What compromises do we have to be ready to make? Uh, there have been times, for example, there was a time in uh, in the 80s in Seattle when uh, Jobs with Justice was uh, uh, looking at its organization and there were a number of uh, radical organizations, including ours, that were part of uh, Jobs with Justice. The Machinists, Local 751, which was the biggest local in the Machinists at the time, it was the Boeing local, uh, it was the biggest local, uh, biggest union in Washington state, it played a decisive role in what the labor movement as a whole was going to do, and they said, we want to be part of this movement, but not if political parties are represented. Well, we're opposed to that position. That's not a healthy position in our opinion. Nonetheless, we did not support those who said, who took the opposite position. That's wrong, so if you adopt that, we're going to leave. We said our participation and what name it is under. We had people there who were representing the party. We had people there from different unions. We had people there from different uh, community and religious and uh, neighborhood organizations who were participating. We would still be there. We would still be able to participate in the struggle, whether our name was on the letterhead or not. So we we did not support the efforts to drive the biggest union local in the state out of the coalition or give them the excuse to leave. We didn't put ourselves first, we put the movement first, we put the issues first, we put it building unity first. So that's another 
uh, tip, if you will, is not to get so wrapped up in our own vision that we uh, we end up alienating allies who we need to be working with and give ourselves the space to work with them and convince them otherwise. So that's, that's uh, I don't have any other uh, tips and tricks other than uh, recognizing what is unifying and what is uh, divisive in that current moment rather than what's, what's the politically correct uh, abstract way to look at it. In an abstract way, of course, we would have said political parties, including ours, should be free to contend on this battle, uh, the battle for um, winning a correct strategy for this coalition. Um, but that wasn't the, the most important issue at that moment. The most important issue was maintaining the unity of the coalition. So it's not that we should always put ourselves on the back burner, it's that we have to correctly judge the political moment and put forward what is best for the movement, not what's best for our party or how many seats on a steering committee can we win, but what's best for the movement and people will respect that. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that's, that's that. Uh, so we're at about uh, an hour and we're going to move to some Pre participant presentations, uh, sections of the main report that Joe Sims gave to our national convention, and that'll be Todd T. And then uh, from the party program, section four, the democratic struggle, Zach B. And section five, unity against the extreme right by Nicole S. Uh, these are all comrades from a uh, new Seattle club, the Irene Hall Club. So I thank them for volunteering to do that and we'll move to those presentations and then we'll return to uh, questions and comments and discussion afterwards. So uh, Todd T, if we could. Todd, your mic is open on, there you are. Speak up, please. Todd. Your mic is open. Our end, your end, but we don't hear you. Okay. Right. There's something wrong with Todd's sound. Okay. Well, let's let's shift to Zach, and we'll come back to Todd and see if we can uh, catch him uh, at the tail end rather than the beginning. Uh, Zach. Okay. Okay. Zach, your mic is open on our. Here you are. And can can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. I tried my best to summarize, but uh, it may be a little bit of expansion on Article 4 in some areas, so I'm just going to read what I wrote here. Um, the program recognizes that the history of this country is one with many struggles to expand democracy. The early history uh, is, to, is a struggle to expand democracy away from just propertied white men. Then it was to include freed slaves and fight a fight which did not end at the passage of the 15th Amendment or the Civil Rights Act, but carries on today. The struggle to expand democracy made headway with the 19th Amendment, expanding democratic rights to women, although barriers remain for women of color. While it is the case that as time moves along, democracy has expanded, it is apparent that democratic rights under the capitalist system are not only restricted, but under attack. The United States is considered a leader in the uh, quote unquote, free world. The program recognizes this rightfully as propaganda for the reasons soon to be listed and the restrictions to voting that make themselves most clear to the poorest, most oppressed people of this country. Winner take all elections and the lack of real alternatives discourage millions more from participating in what little democratic arenas we are allowed to. Our program lists more restrictions to voting as Republican backed voter ID laws, limited polling places, little to no early voting, and gerrymandered voting districts that weaken progressives and strengthen conservatives and reactionaries. Also mentioned, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, also mentioned incarcerated individuals struggle to gain democratic rights. The program acknowledges how the war on drugs targeted black and brown people, putting them in prisons and condemning many with a lifetime of no right to a voice at the ballot box. A loss to our struggle for democracy came from a Supreme Court came from Supreme Court decisions like Citizens United. This decision equated speech to money and allowed corporations and the wealthiest capitalists to 
uh, quote unquote, speak millions into funds into the pockets of their preferred candidates and campaigns. <clears throat> Elections are already limited to the wealthy as candidates because of their time and funding. A tax on equal voice and one person, one vote made it made it more, <laughs> sorry, made it more favored against the working class. As these corporations are given free reign to fund whatever campaign they want to win, unions and civil rights organizations are restricted from these same rules. Our right to protest also comes under attack when police violence is so readily used against anyone gathered in a public space without proper permits or insurance. More threats against protests are seen by the far right being emboldened to use violence themselves through stochastic terrorists like Donald Trump. Barriers to unionization limit democracy to political races and don't easily allow for the expansion of democracy to our workplaces. Our fight to expand democratic rights to the workers is a struggle to gain democratic input of control of the economy. When we engage to the in the struggle for democracy, we are including the struggle for peace, racial equality, equality for the nationally oppressed, for women's equality, job programs, social services, and increased wages. When the struggle to gain these is undertaken, so too is the struggle for democracy. An important distinction is made in our program between class struggle and democratic struggle. Working class struggle, in our case, is the fight to subordinate capital to labor. Democratic struggle is the fight to achieve equality in all its forms and in all its arenas, widening democratic space for all working people. And that's a direct quote from the program. As we struggle for socialism, we will see, quote, democracy progressing in a planned process in harmony with the dominance of working class power, end quote. In socialism victory, a new stage of democratic development will become clear. The importance of the democratic struggle to the class struggle is that it opens up a space where alliances and coalitions can be created between labor and other forces seeking democratic expansion. Our struggles strengthen each other, especially when in opposition to the far right. Democratic struggles weaken the capitalist class due to their ability to engage millions of workers in affecting the outcomes of these struggles. Our path forward, our path towards socialism is to defend and enlarge democracy in every real, every realm of life. Uh, the program made, makes this direct quote of Lenin. He says, all democracy consists in the proclamation and realization of rights which under capitalism are realizable only to the very small degree and only relatively. But without training the masses in the spirit of this struggle, socialism is impossible. So in short, and, and that's the end of the quote. So in short, as the masses struggle towards democracy, they will reach the conclusion of revolution into socialism since capitalism refuses to truly realize democracy. And then the program goes on to list uh, several points uh, that we stand for. And I, I won't, I'll encourage people to read those on their own. Thanks, Zach, that's great. Uh, and now section five, unity against the extreme right, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I, um, yes, my name is uh, Nicole and I'm a member of the Irene Hole Club in Seattle. Um, section five of the party is titled Unity Against the Extreme Right. Um, it states that to effectively challenge the extreme right, we must acknowledge that the path to socialism cannot be achieved all at once. Instead, it requires a series of progressive struggles with each stage bringing us closer to a society where working class power prevails. Understanding the current phase of struggle requires a deep analysis of the capitalist system's development and the unity of working class and progressive forces. Right now, our most urgent task is to confront the extreme right, a coalition of reactionary transnational corporations and political operatives that have taken over the Republican Party. Since the 1980s, this faction has steadily eroded civil rights, dismantled social safety nets, and pursued policies that benefit only the wealthiest sectors of society. From Ronald Reagan to Donald Trump, the extreme right has thrived on authoritarianism, militarism, and exploitation. 
The extreme right is far from a monolithic group. It includes multinational corporations, religious fundamentalists, white nationalists, and right-wing militias. These forces are driven by the shared goal of dismantling social programs, deepening inequality, and maintaining U.S. military dominance. Their rise was fueled by decades of well-funded campaigns, including the creation of an alternate media ecosystem to promote white right-wing propaganda from the Tea Party to Trump's MAGA movement. Crucially, the extreme right seeks to divide working people. Their tools are racism, misogyny, uh, xenophobia, which they use to stoke fear and pit communities against one another. Their voter suppression tactics, especially targeting African Americans, are an effort to maintain their grip on political power despite growing demographic changes and progressive sentiment here in the United States. To defeat the extreme right, we need a broad unified movement. This movement must be led by labor and the working class, but it must also include every group whose interests are in conflict with the extreme rights agenda. This coalition, like Mark mentioned today, must include communities of color, youth, environmental activists, women, LGBTQ advocates, and others committed to democracy. The fight against the extreme right is not just an electoral struggle, it's a fight for the future of our country and for the democratic rights of all people. Building this unity is critical. We must expand grassroots organizing, particularly in regions that have been historically neglected, such as the South and rural areas. Racism, bigotry, and fear weaken us, but by bringing people together across race, gender, and geography, we can strengthen our movement and push back against the extreme rights divisive tactics. The extreme rights success has been partly due to its ability to obscure its true agenda from its base. Many people who vote for extreme right candidates are unaware that these politicians are acting against their own material interests. Through grassroots education and organizing, we can reach these voters and help them understand how their economic struggles are linked to the broader fight for justice and democracy. We must also recognize that there are divisions within the capitalist class itself. Not all sections of transnational capital are fully aligned with the extreme rights agenda. Some capitalists, particularly those who are more moderate or environmentally conscious, may be reluctant to embrace the extreme rights full authoritarianism. This creates an opportunity for alliances where we can work together on shared goals, such as defending democratic rights and addressing climate change. However, we can't lose sight of our ultimate object objective, which is defeating the extreme right in the electoral arena is a crucial step, but it's not enough on its own. The fight against the extreme right is part of a larger struggle against capitalism itself. And until we replace the capitalist system with socialism, the threat of the extreme right will remain. Capitalism by its very nature generates inequality, exploitation, and reactionary political movements. By uniting against the extreme right, we can weaken not only the most reactionary sectors of the ruling class, but also the capitalist system as a whole. The struggle to curb the power of the monopolies will teach millions of people the methods of collective action and the power of solidarity. As we win battles against the extreme right, we'll be building the foundations for future victories, victories that will bring us closer to a society based on equality, justice, and true working class power. And the a task ahead is daunting, but it's achievable. Again, through collective action, grassroots organizing, and broad coalition building, we can defeat the extreme right and pave the way for a more just and equitable society. The struggle will not end with one election or one victory, but with continued effort, we can create the conditions for lasting change. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole, okay. and we'll go back to Todd now. All right, Todd, something, um, we can't hear you, sorry. Well, we'll proceed, and Todd, if you uh, uh, manage to sort of figure out what the problem is and solve it, uh, uh, just uh, let us know and uh, we'll bring you back in. Uh, I want to thank Zach and Nicole for uh, their summaries of those sections of the program. Uh, I think you may have, you might have, it might have felt like a, uh, an echo or some repetition because that, and that's intentional. All these things fit together. What we've been talking about is 
our strategy, which is embodied in the party program. And uh, we just, just these many different ways of looking at the subject. What's the current moment? What's the unity that can be built? What's the next stage of struggle and how can we get there? Uh, what are the obstacles? These are all, as I said, part of the application of the dialectical method to the development of strategy. Um, I did want to um, make a, a two points. One, uh, Nicole's point about um, the extreme right success by hiding their real aims. And that's why we have a unique tool this time, and that is Project 2025. It's so important because it reveals what their goals really are, not the rhetoric that Trump spews at his rallies, uh, not the, uh, you know, um, the tidbits, the shiny uh, things that he offers to try and gain a few working class votes, but what their basic aims really are, which is, uh, I mean, it's a 900 page document. I, you know, we, we know what they are, setting up concentration camps, uh, eliminating restrictions on the super rich and what they can do with their money, eliminating restrictions on companies and their managers on how much they can oppress their workers. Uh, chipping further away at uh, our limited democracy, cutting taxes on the rich, and on and on and on. They're telling us what they would like to do if they can seize hold of power. And they'll try and be even more vigorous about it uh, than during the first Trump administration. One of the things, one of the reasons why they went to the, uh, the step of building out this plan now is because they don't, uh, in 2016, not only Trump, but m many of uh, his top supporters and contributors never expected him to win. They did not have a plan. They didn't have a list of, here's all the pe people we want to bring into the some 4,000 uh, positions that get appointed with a new presidency. Um, and as a result, they feel they they uh, they didn't accomplish everything that they could have of parts of their agenda. So this was a a, a project to uh, codify their strategy, their policies, what they will try and do. Appoint fire 50,000 people and appoint their own folks for all of those government jobs. Um, you know making clear this from the beginning that all of these uh, substantive and structural changes that they want to make so that they can maintain power once it's in their hands. Um, so they, they were, they felt like they had been caught short and didn't take full advantage. Uh, they kind of ignore the reality that those immediate and nasty steps that Trump took were immediately opposed by millions of people. There was the Women's March of 4 million people, four women's marches, I should say, of about 4 million people. There was the uh, a Muslim ban, which met with uh, mostly spontaneous opposition in demonstrations at airports. Uh, there were many other forms of opposition. And the reason that Trump didn't uh, get to accomplish everything he wanted was because he ran into the majority of people in the country, this country, and he realized they did not have the political capital to implement their full agenda. Their goal now is to ignore the opposition, to not try and pretend to be normal political actors, but to uh, get as much structural change in place so that they can maintain their power. And I wanted to also discuss another aspect of the democratic struggle, because we shouldn't, uh, and this gets to not buying into any illusions about people who are allies or marching along a similar path when it comes to protecting the basics of the right to vote, the right for one person, one vote, the right to have your vote counted, the right to make it easier to vote rather than harder to vote. That basic fundamental Democrat, bourgeois democratic right 
is the basis for democracy. And we can unite with many people or agree with many people or march alongside many people who are also in favor of that. However, our interest in democracy goes further. Our interest is in real substantive democracy, which includes that most basic level of the right to vote and everything that that encompasses to more democratic control of our economy and economic decisions, an end to the dictatorship of owners and, uh, and managers in the workplace. Um, because right now we have formal political democracy, but they make no pretense that when you go to work, you get a vote over anything. Uh, every once in a while, they'll have uh, worker circles or some other gimmick to try and uh, convince workers that they should buy into what's best for the company is best for the workers. What we're talking about is real substantive control by the workers over economic decisions and over the majority of people over the capitalist class. Uh, and that substantive real democracy includes democracy in action, active citizen involvement in governing and in carrying out the work. So it's not just okay, you get to vote, so more of you should vote and you should convince more other people to vote. That's all great. And that's that basic level of formal democracy, which is essential. But it is not full, real, substantive democracy where we make structural changes such that we can't uh, go back to uh, only formal democracy by the involvement and participation of millions in not just voting, but in control of the economy and policing what companies do and try and get away with and direct involvement in the projects of government, which are good, those projects which are good for everybody. So our interest is in formal political democracy and real substantive democracy and all the people who are with us on the right to vote are not going to necessarily be with us on real substantive democracy. That doesn't mean we don't work with them now. Absolutely, we should. Uh, that's part of building a movement strong enough to implement, uh, to protect and uh, expand formal bourgeois democracy, the right to vote, the right to have your say, the right to have your vote count, the right to have the majority rule instead of playing games with the electoral college. Uh, so when uh, the Democratic candidates win the majority of votes, they still lose the electoral college uh, and other ways that they're trying to game the system. The gerrymandering is a prime example of that. So I wanted to make sure there's those two elements of democracy and just because someone says they're in this for the fight, they're in the fight to protect democracy and to protect uh, or the history of democracy in our country, that doesn't mean they're now at this point ready to go further to fighting for real substantive democracy in economic decisions and economic rights. Um, so our interest is in both sides of that. Not everybody that we're working with is ready for that step yet, and that's fine. We'll work with them where they're at. Um, so uh, I guess I'll, uh, it's time to open the floor for more on uh, more time for discussion and questions and comments. And I have some sample questions if uh, you need a prompt. How well does our strategy and program match the current moment? Are we losing our socialist vision by getting mired in the struggles of the current moment? How do we build the party? How do we act as revolutionaries in a non-revolutionary moment? So again, the floor is open for your questions and comments. Okay, Nicole, your mic is open. Hi, Mark. Is it okay if I share uh, what Todd T. wrote on the uh, main report? Um, he sent it to me and I can read it. 
Absolutely, that would be great. Thanks. Wonderful. So uh, this is what uh, Todd T wrote um, about uh, the section of the main report. So the main report to the 32nd National Convention of the Communist Party USA presented by Joe Sims co-chair was unanimously adopted. United we stand to defeat the MAGA right. Fascist threat at home, immigrants are a special target. First, they tried the wall, then the Muslim ban. Now they're planning concentration camps. Think mass firings, think public lynchings, think public trials for the act of thinking. They plan to dismantle programs like food stamps and Section 8. They plan to get rid of the NLRB and the EPA. They're going after marriage rights, civil rights, labor rights. Now, we're not saying that the country would be fascist the day after Trump is elected. No, it will be the struggle over the implementation of their plans that will determine the shape of things to come. What will Trump do when the people rise up and say no? Will he invoke the Insurrection Act, call out the National Guard and the militias, suspend the Constitution? Democracy as we know it, with all its limitations, would be eliminated. This would be a government of a new type. Not a difference in degree, but a difference in kind. It would mean the substitution of one form of bourgeois rule over for another. Do we already live under fascism? Fascism today is a special product of the imperialist stage of capitalism. It is characterized by a unique form of class rule. When you have a dictatorship of particular sections of the ruling class over all other sections and over society, when there's no space for struggle, when the opposition is outlawed, when you have martial law and are forced to live in exile, then we can talk of fascism's arrival on these shores. Struggle against fascism has begun. Strikes are up and concessions are down. A broad left has been present in labor for many decades now. It is anti-corporate, anti-war, anti-racist, anti-sexist, pro-peace, and pro-environment. It has a small but growing Marxist contingent. Party vision for labor. Because we have a multiracial, multinational, and multigender working class, this vision must address inherent inequalities within the class. Building the party in specific industries and in specific working class communities. The most important thing that we can do is to rebuild the party in the working class and in the trade union movement. Everything hinges on that. Now is the time for workers to organize and push as hard as possible for wages and benefits and for health and safety. Now is the time to push for housing and for canceling student debt. Now is the time to tax the rich. Some people call this lesser evilism, but we call it fighting for space. We call it choosing the battlefield on which we fight, and you've got to be in it to win it. Voting as a conscious act of collective action. Voting is just one step. When you vote, you block and you affirm. That's great. It's a beginning. You have to be united, and we know that this unity is possible because as workers, we face a common system of exploitation. And in that system of exploitation, there is more that unites us than divides us. Collectivity is our superpower. Comrades have to understand the why of things. Therefore, cadre development must also provide a clear understanding of the ideas behind what we do. This demands a working knowledge of the party program and the ideological basis for it. Our strength is in our clubs and districts, the communist press, the YCL, the role of the convention to round out the main report, deepen it, amplify it, and if necessary, change its propositions. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Are we now going to questions and comments? Absolutely. All right. All right. Tanya, your mic is open. Oh, yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Wonderful session again uh, to Mark. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I have two question, uh, questions or comments. Um, the first one has to do with the international solidarity. I think Mark mentioned the a turn, for example, in the struggle to end the apartheid, that the ANC and the partner, the Communist Party of South Africa, made a strategic decision to launch 
uh, I mean, inter, uh, to mobilize international support, solidarity. And that was uh, uh, very important, I think. And it was a turning point and it was global. Um, they made a distinction. They were very careful in, the, in identifying, for example, the American people as allies, as friends of the liberation movement, vis-a-vis -vis the government, uh, which uh, supported the apartheid regime. So, so they were able to do that very, care, very well, I think. The same thing, I think, applied to uh, the Vietnam. Uh, uh, the, the, the leaders of the uh, Vietnam did identify the importance of international solidarity. So I talk about international solidarity. Now, how do we here in the United States uh, approach this question of international solidarity for our struggles here? Uh, I have noticed that quite a number of people can come to the struggle, to the power party through uh, through that they are motivated, for example, what's happening in Gaza and everything else. But uh, how do we actually uh, uh, use that for the struggles here in the United States against the extreme right and the, the whole thing that you have uh, kind of uh, 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 described in your presentation very well indeed. How do we do that? How do we link that so that they, they are not just uh, 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 going through the international solidarity, but they understand it also in terms of our own internal struggles here in the United States? That was the first question. The other one is the comment. Uh, very uh, quickly, Kanye. Okay, let me, let me end there then. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, we're looking for other raised hands. Okay, Matthew. Matthew, try again. Oh, yes. Me now? Yes, we can okay. hear. You. One of the things I wanted to mention is now I'm in the greater Houston area and it's a very regressive area. And one of the things I wanted to mention is that when people we talk to people we I think we should focus on the here and now. Talking about uh and something that's been very helpful to me was a booklet by Roberta Wood, um, and I believe it was published by uh, the Communist Party USA, and it's called Marxism in the Era of Amazon and Uber. It's very easy to read, and it doesn't get into some of the in-group jargon. There's no mention of reactionary. There's no mention of bourgeois. There's no mention of imperialism, cadres, uh, dialectical materialism. A lot of that stuff, I have a hard time wrapping my head around. And that's kind of the in-group jargon. And something that I found very helpful was that Mark explained things in understandable language. If we go to other people and we, we, we use a bunch of terms that they're unfamiliar with, that's not very helpful. Uh, one of the things that the Houston Club has talked about, they have a draft plan of work, and they say, become involved in local organizations and outreaches. So that might be, for example, the Democratic Party, voting for, for progressive candidates or candidates who are against um, uh, the, React, you know, reactionary Demic, uh, Republican Party. And I, that's just something I wanted to mention. If we talk to people and we use language that they don't even understand what we're talking about, that's not very helpful. That's just all, something I wanted to mention. That's all. Thank you. Okay, looking for more raised hands. Alexander, your mic is open. Please open the mic on your end. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> hello again. Um, so, Basically, uh, regarding the entryism question, I was talking about more about not sorting for a labor union or in an industry to make it to a union, but uh, for example, a communist joins an immigrants' rights group. 
should they, let's say, quote unquote, convert people to Marxism, Leninism, or communism? Uh, and I don't believe that should be the case. I think that entryism is, will just fray tensions with other organizations, but that's just me. Um, and if people want to become a communist, they can, we can teach them, we can, we, can make, we can direct them to the text, but we shouldn't be, you know, actively trying to uh, be like a religious preacher and try to like get people on our side through communism, let's say. Um, and I, I don't know, I just want to know if like you agree with that per se, or I don't know. Thank you, good day. <laughs> One more run through for raised hands. All right, Dimitri, your mic is open very quickly, please. Hello, you can hear me? Yes. Yeah. I just want to underline one thing that Joe said. We should have a working knowledge of the party program. I think it's 74 pages. In my opinion, each one of us should have it in hand. It doesn't use jargon. It speaks clear text. And let's say even the issue of immigration, it goes into detail, even about different minority groups. So you can talk about the people with our party program. It's all future oriented. It's an analysis of the working class, no jargon. And uh, D, if I may say so, every member who pays dues should be given a copy. I know it's only 2019, but and I hope we have a 2024 coming out. It is so important. And I've written to Joe about it. I, I mean, I quote it all the time in, in, in club meetings. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. Um, thank you. Okay, a, a few uh, responses. Uh, to that, I, I do, do have just one quibble with uh, Todd's presentation. It's a small quibble, uh, but he says, we, you know, the fight against fascism, if fascism gains full power, there's no space for struggle. Well, I think there's always space for struggle. The difficulties and obstacles and limitations change, and it's certainly much more difficult. Um, but there is always space for struggle. There's a, a fascinating book uh, called uh, The Communist Resistance in Nazi Germany from a British publisher, which was on my uh, recommended reading list, where he talks about the things that communists did. And there were people who were released from prison or from concentration camp and went right back to organizing, went right back to finding a way to get leaflets out, even if you couldn't hand them out in an obvious way. There were already people who, uh, you know, went and did postering campaigns uh, that the, the Nazis had to then go clean up. Uh, there were people who always found a way to continue the struggle. Although that's just a, a, a slight quibble. Uh, talking about uh, international uh, international solidarity, um, a, a, a great example of this was the struggle to free Angela Davis. Um, this is a so a, a personal story. I was attending a party school in New York when Angela was arrested. Uh, shortly after she was arrested and uh, moved to New York, uh, she was in prison at the Women's Detention Center in Lower Manhattan. Uh, and there was a already long planned, I believe it was a 70th birthday party for Gus Hall. And that night I was sitting in the audience with about a thousand people. And Gus said, well, you know, this is nice to hear people say nice things about me, but the point of this is to organize something. We're going to start a movement here tonight to free Comrade Angela Davis, and it's going to uh, gain support from large sections of the U.S. population. In fact, it's going to become a worldwide struggle, and we start it tonight. And after the thing was over, uh, uh, bunch of us, several hundred of us, went down and demonstrated outside the Women's Detention Center. 
in my own head, uh, I was, I believe, 18 at the time. <clears throat> I said, oh, that sounds good. That's a rallying cry. But what's all this? Oh, a worldwide international movement. He's, uh, he's dreaming. Uh, we wish that would happen, but that's not reality. Well, he was right and I was wrong. It became a worldwide movement. Uh, and that international pressure, you know, when she had a trial, there weren't just, wasn't just the US media that was there. It was media from all over the world. It was, they were receiving uh, petitions and pressure and uh, objections from many parts of the world. And that played a huge role in her release, not in the, um, the immediate courtroom uh, battle, but in the atmosphere around it, in the number of people who paid attention, in the number of people who took an active interest, in the number of people who signed petitions, in all kinds of ways, and that affected the context in which the courtroom battle took place. So that was a classic example of how that worked. Another one which um, I think our party can take a great deal of pride in, in the in the mid to late 70s, before the fight against apartheid and the fight to free Mandela became a worldwide mass fight of millions, our party started to highlight freeing Nelson Mandela. Uh, we worked, there was a, a organization, the National Alliance against, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm mixing the two up. There's another organization which we had played a major role in founding uh, related to international issues. And they were among, among the first in this country to focus on freeing Nelson Mandela as a way to rally the movement way before it became, and it did become again, a struggle that involved tens of millions of people around the globe and millions of people in our country and changed the politics around support for South Africa from the active support that Reagan gave to the apartheid regime to having to uh, make concessions and implement uh, limited sanctions and uh, you know various other things. Uh, and it, it works, uh, that kind of international solidarity can work in both direction after Reagan, I believe it was after Reagan's second election when many of us were demoralized. We had put a lot of effort into defeating Reagan uh, for the, his second election in 84. Um, and a lot of us were, you know, was depressed. We, 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 it was a, a defeat, not a victory. Uh, what were we going to do? And uh, I think within a week or two, uh, a group of people had uh, initiated uh, demonstrations at the South African Embassy in Washington, D.C., where uh, people were uh, arrested. There was civil disobedience. There was a determined struggle uh, against the position of the uh, Reagan administration, but also against directly against the South African government. And that burst open that struggle. Uh, it happened in many areas in Seattle. There was a, a consulate. It was a, you know, a sort of a, uh, it wasn't a serious position. It wasn't a full-time paid position. It was somebody who, who helped facilitate trade negotiations and, you know, put out bullshit that the South African government had wanted pulled out, wanted put out. Uh, well, here, as in many parts of the country, there were weekly demonstrations with weekly arrests at the South African consulates all over the country. That was one step of that struggle becoming mass. And it wasn't just a solidarity struggle for them. It encouraged us. It showed us the way to fight against this uh, recently re-elected reactionary president. So international solidarity is not just about being, uh, supporting people in other countries, it's about supporting ourselves because their struggles help us too. Um, and in answer to, to Dimitri, there, the, the program is going to be updated. I don't know the, uh, uh, the details of, of when, but they're going to, uh, what they presented to the convention was that it's a primarily uh, a, an updating. So we're not talking about uh, 
Trump as the sitting president. So we're not uh, making reference, you know, 1919 and 1918, or 2019 and 2018 references, but updating the current ones. So there will be an update of that. It's not going to be a fundamental uh, redoing of it, but making sure that it's up to date and not using outdated references. So I, I'm not sure exactly uh, when that'll be available, but it should be fairly soon. Uh, and to Matthew, I'm absolutely in agreement. We use commonly understood terms when we're talking. Uh, a webinar like this is to help us understand the tools of the dialectical method and our our strategy and our strategy development. And yes, there's jargon and um, you know particular phrases that have a particular meaning that other people don't get. That, that's because this is not uh, the issuing a mass pamphlet. This is training our leadership. This is training our membership. Um, and so that so we do use some of those phrases, but we always need to endeavor to speak with people where they're at and uh, to Alexander, uh, absolutely, I agree with you about entryism. The, the goal, our purpose, in, of course, we want to recruit people wherever we're working. But our goal in entering organizations is not to say, OK, here's a, a captive audience for our recruiting efforts. Our goal is to build that unity in struggle of that organization, connect that issue to other, is other organizations and other issues to build wide spread broad unity and the way around that is not to focus on okay here's an opportunity we get to talk at people about how what they ought to think it's our job to participate with them in our joint struggles to put the needs of the organization and the goals of the organization and the issue first that's uh, of course, we want to recruit members in the process, but not by trying to capture organizations or capture leadership or uh, take advantage of being a member to uh, talk about what we think they ought to think all the time, but rather to talk about our shared goals and objectives. Um, so that's. Um, uh, that's that. I'd like to move on to some closing, and we uh, may uh, get to end a minute or two early. We'll see. I wanted to remind us of the basic party strategy to build unity among the core forces, to build unity between movements, to link issues and build coalitions so those uh, that struggle expands to engage on every field of struggle we can, to build that unity around working to defeat the extreme right and maintain and expand our democratic uh, rights to demonstrate, protest, vote, uh, and participate in the politics of our country. And our main goal is to decisively defeat the extreme right, even a defeat uh, of Trump this time in the election of Harris will not represent by itself a decisive defeat against the extreme right any more than the election of Biden did in 2020. It's an important step. It creates the possibility for more aggressive and advanced struggle for actual solutions to the problems facing the workers and people of our country. But just because Biden was elected, the ultra right didn't go away and we're seeing them even more hyper, you know, uh, what's, what's the word hyperbolic in their, uh, in their rhetoric, even more threatening of injecting violence into the political process. Uh, they're escalating because what they were doing before didn't win what they wanted, so they want to escalate. So just a, an election of Harris, does uh, it leaves us open to the struggles that we'll have to engage in against the Harris administration over uh, international policies. Uh, the struggles we'll need to engage when they propose programs that are good but not good enough. Uh, when they 
make concessions to the right in order to get one thing passed, uh, we'll have to engage in struggles against the Harris administration. But we will also have to continue the struggle against the extreme right, because they still have a stranglehold in way too many state legislatures. They still have uh, bully pulpits where they can talk to tens of millions of people to try and convince them of the, of the extreme right program. So those struggles will need to continue no matter who wins. Of course, it'll be the, the, the costs and dangers of the struggle if Trump is elected are different than we will face under a Harris administration, but the struggle will continue in either case. So I'd like to ask some evaluation questions. We can maybe take uh, uh, five minutes or so. Was the series too long or too short? What would make it easier for you to join the discussion? Was there too much lecture? Not enough? Uh, are there any subjects that should have been covered in more depth or subjects we didn't cover that should have been? And you're welcome to respond now. And I see that uh, uh, D has put up a poll. Uh, you can respond now or email me after you've thought about it, uh, Mark Brodine, without a capital M. <laughs> I don't know why that did. Mark Brodine, one dot MB at Gmail. So the floor again is open for your opinions of this series and what we can do to improve it. Or were there issues that weren't covered that should have been? Okay, the floor is open for discussion again. Uh, we'll wait for a few more minutes before we close the poll. You will also receive a few evaluation questions uh, when you receive your thank you for attending or you missed, uh, uh, unfortunately you missed those, those uh, closing emails or final emails for this series, so please respond to those evaluation questions as well. So we're looking for raised hands. All right, Alexander, very quickly, please. Of course, yeah, I'm here. Um, so I'm Alexander from Virginia, CPUSA member, uh, rank and file. Um, I definitely think that like uh, uh, what you say is very pertinent to what we have to deal with right now, and I like how you explain things. I only wish there could be a bit more specifics, like what has been tried in the past that actually worked. Uh, that's a good that's a good vector to go through. And lastly, um, uh, but otherwise, I, I did enjoy it very very immensely, and I found it very edifying. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. Okay, Dimitri, very quickly, please. I'm sorry, I left my hand open, but I do have to say it has been an outstanding education. I'm so happy to know it's going to be recorded because really this could have been the semester's work <laughs> in a college class with this professor. And more, more, more. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dimitri. All right, Sandy, we're opening the mic. Yes, yes, go on. Good, thank you very much. Um, uh, in uh, Joe Sims' uh, uh, presentation of the main political report in June, he said, quote, Biden's Israel policy must be defeated today so that Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump and MAGA can be defeated tomorrow. At the end of the first session, I raised the question of how, do, how does this relate to those of us uh, embedded in the peace and solidarity movements and our fight against the ongoing genocide that our tax dollars are making possible. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Stefan, if I remember correctly, the pronunciation, Stefan, your mic is open, go on. Thank you, Dee. Um, yeah, I had just a couple comments on the format. I don't know if um, there are any alternatives that the party is considering, but I, I have some just weird technical issues with go to webinar um, pretty often. So I don't know if that's uh, something it seems like maybe it, there could be other platforms that would work better. Um, the class itself was massively educational. Um, I learned much more than I even expected and I expected to learn a lot. Um, and then just a kind of question observation as you know, we had the vice presidential debates 
a few days ago, same day that uh, Claudia Scheinbaum was being inaugurated as the first female president in Mexico. And I'm, I'm just wondering about, you know, any potential to, to link our broader democratic efforts to the different international electoral gains. So with, uh, you know, Mexico's long history with the U.S. and the current demonization coming from the right wing, their uh, Morena party has, has really managed to concentrate working class power and such a way as to actually threaten uh, the establishment corruption in that country. And I'm just wondering if um, maybe there are any strategies that we can implement to uh, connect, you know, our, our own democratic movements here with, with that movement in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Looking for more raised hands. Uh, I'd like to ask a qu uh, question. Uh, is there a difference between the extreme uh, right and the fascists? That's my question. One other mm -hmm. raised hand. Uh, Carl, open the mic on your end. Um, uh, first, I think the whole uh, series has just been uh, amazingly helpful and, uh, and well put together. And I congratulate Mark on that. Um, one thing that I think uh, showed up in this presentation that could probably be expanded for the future is uh, specific examples of how the party's policy has been applied in particular struggles. Um, uh, Mark gave a couple of them in this presentation. I think they were well chosen and they were illustrative. Um, but others might be available. For, for example, uh, we have a lot of people who have been active in the labor movement for many years. And they, some of them may recall specific examples of when they were able to apply the party's strat strategy to build the unity. And, uh, uh, and I, th I think those kind of examples would be very helpful for people who are trying to learn the practical application of the party's program. That's all. Well, Thank thanks, you. everybody. We're we're coming up to our ending time, so I, I don't have a chance time to respond in depth to those. Uh, but uh, just want to make a couple of points. Uh, yes, absolutely. Specifics would be great, and uh, that is a, a bit more work, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's very helpful to have real life examples. And that also leads back to something I want to acknowledge a comment that someone made a couple of sessions ago that would be good to, to end on positive notes rather than uh, difficult ones. But having real examples of uh, positive experiences when our approach has worked uh, would be great. Um, and I tried to do that, but uh, it was it was uh, you know time and space and uh, energy were, were limited. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely true that the victories in other countries encourage our movements. Uh, I've often thought that after uh, decades internationally, where uh, general strikes were. Uh, basically did not happen. Uh, they had in Italy and in France, I think they had some one day ones, but it was not a, a tool that people thought of as available. And then I think this was sometime in the late 80s or early 90s in Korea, there was a general strike that went on for weeks. And so their, their victories, their struggles encourage ours. They open people's eyes beyond our ranks to what is possible. Um, so that's uh, a great thing. Um, I'm looking at Dee's question. Uh, I think there are differences in the extreme between the extreme right and the the conscious, deliberate fascists. Um, just like there are differences between the deliberate, conscious fascists and the masses of voters to whom they appeal. Uh, and it's our job to find those. And they might be little cracks, but they're cracks. Uh, I've already used the example of Liz Cheney, who voted with Trump's program 92% of the time. She's a fairly serious and, I don't know, extreme conservative. So there is 
Blessed did when she saw that what they were doing was delegitimizing the system, bludgeoning uh, people's rights, making it people believe the system didn't work and couldn't work, and they should doubt it. And that uh, was scary to us to some sections of the capitalist class. So I think there are differences. It's uh, in some cases they're small, but they are real. The, the number of people who are conscious fascists is very small. The number of people who say, I want to help establish fascism in the US is real uh, and small, but uh, it plays a leading role in pushing the right farther right, in pushing violence in the streets, in pushing a brutal program where the creation of brutality and the creation of fear is the point of the policy. Um, I think the sp thinking of it as splits in the ruling class is more useful for our strategic thinking. Uh, but we should find ways to, as Dimitrov said, in sending communists into the fascist unions, the, the it didn't matter if the people they were working with saw themselves as fascists even, or in support of the fascist program. What mattered was if there was a potential for struggle. So that's, that's the I think, the key thing. Um, I don't, I may have missed something. Um, and I, I, I love to have specific examples and I don't have enough of them by myself. So I think that would take a more collective approach. Uh, but I want to thank all of you who attended in person, those who signed up to get the recordings, those who have volunteered to, to take readings and present to the group, those of you who have asked for the slideshows, especially if you plan to use them as the basis for club educationals or self-study. Thanks to Dee for setting it all up and moderating. I want to specifically thank those who volunteered, Todd, Nicole, Zach, Mickey, Devin, Marnia, Walker, and Stefan for their contribution to our dialogue. And thanks to the party as a whole for a lifetime of lessons in the struggle. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you everyone for participating. Please remember October 27th is the date for the young Marxists uh, speaking on uh, the environment. Then November 24th for the young Marxists uh, exploring uh, Victor Afanasyev's or Afanasyev's, whichever uh, book on historical materialism. To a, and then look forward, please, to our uh, national online Marxist school, uh, which will run 10 or more classes uh, in January and February, where the most of us are. In the, home, in the house because of the weather, but uh, please look forward to our 10 or more session uh, National Online Marxist School in January and February. Thank you so much for your engagement in this uh, series, and thank you again, uh, Mark. Have a good day, everyone.